watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. My name is Grayson Perry, and I'm an artist, a husband, a father, and a man. What's a real man, anyone's on a mountain tonight? <laughs> Men have tended to rule the world, and in many ways, we still do. There's a degree of being a, war a warrior prophet. But I think we're a stranger, a more interesting bunch than we let on. <laughs> you think it's weird in Wigan? Yeah, just all different places. Really? I've been dressing up as a woman since I was 12 years old, and uh, so I've kind of been forced to look at gender. And I feel, that even though I'm quite masculine, transvestism has given me enough distance that I can turn round and look at that tower of power that is masculinity. In this series, I'm going to put myself into three of the most ultra-male worlds I can find. Hi, yeah, I'm Grayson Perry, I'm an artist. We're just making a film about men, really. Take a man to end the life. I just wonder if there is a point where you think I have enough money. I want to see what their extreme masculinity can tell us about all men today. But there must be a reason why a lot of men need to be tough. Why do they need to be tough? So you enjoyed the crash then? Oh, did it? I mean, it was a missed, marvellous time. Then I'm going to make art to try to capture what I experience. I don't think this work is my most subtle. <laughs> and show it to the people who inspired it. Thank you. Thank you for making it. In this programme, I've set myself the mission of making art about what makes macho men tick. Some of the hardest men I can think of are cage fighters, so I'm starting this journey in the world of MMA, mixed martial arts. I've come to the northeast of England, where a group of local fighters has agreed to let me into their lives. I'm interested in investigating that quintessence of masculinity, what a lot of people think is really masculine, and that is violence. Aggression. The hunter. Machismo. And perhaps what lies beneath. A lifelong sissy myself, I've never felt at ease around macho men. Little boys are taught to toughen up. But now I'm all grown up, I wonder whether this need to be hard is what's holding men back. Cage fighting is big business in the Northeast, and the region has produced many of its champions. Tip to become the next one is 24-year-old Alex, who's invited me to spend time with him. It's just before a vital weigh-in, and with the help of his friends, Peter and Adam, Alex has been trying to shed 13 pounds in the last 24 hours. I'm just making sort of a sarcophagus out of quilts and towels. It seems quite dangerous, this, is it? Um, if you if you miscalculate it, if you do it wrong, then it's potentially dangerous, yeah. So, Alex, you haven't eaten for 24 hours. You haven't drank for 24 hours. What's your psychological state right now? This is part of the job, you know. It's the day I paid for. 
You're used to this. Yeah. It's not like 15 times now. I'm just going to take your photo because you're looking interesting. I, mean, I think Alex is looking quite saintly lying here. A martyr for the cause. <laughs> so do you think you're a bit of a warrior monk? A little bit, yeah. A little bit samurai. <laughs> Starve myself before the hunt. So it's quite a ritual. Yeah, yeah it's very ritualistic. 146 and 3 8. I suppose I come to this with many of the preconceptions of anybody who hears the phrase cage fighting. I mean, it's interesting from an aesthetic point of view. They, they seem to buy into the very macho, aggressive, the, all the metaphors in the language, it's all kind of warriors and hunting and street fighting man aesthetic, I suppose. But of course, meeting these guys, they seem very dedicated, almost zen-like in their approach to the fight. Uh, they seem incredibly clean cut and very nice guys. And so I'm kind of going, these guys are going to go into a cage and punch and kick and wrestle the hell out of each other in 40 hours' time or something, so, yeah, it's kind of odd. Alex and his friends seemed gentle souls at heart, but another of the fighters I met suggested a darker set of motivations. Andy is one of the region's most feared and brutal scrappers. He gets into the zone for his fights with a grueling series of bouts called a shark tank. I'll stay in the cage. I'll do two minutes with one person. Then a fresh guy will come in, give me hell. The next guy will come in, fresh, give me hell. So on and so on. Come to a point where I'm either leaving this cage being sick or crippled on the floor, you know? Come on, turn around. Come on. Forward, Andy. Forward. 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 Right, right. How was that, Andy? Was it a good session? Not really, because I walked out. Right. Well, you walked, so that you, you'd be satisfied if you were on the floor, would you? Uh, normally. So, so when you're, you know, you're in, in extreme effort, yeah. sort of. What do you get out of that? You know, what's that moment like? The second I walk through them doors, the second I walk out, it's heaven in here. It's heaven. All your problems go away. The second you walk out the door, at the back, your problems are back. These lads here are my family. And you're fighting them? Yeah, because it's what we love. That's what we love. I mean, as a metaphor, that's pretty <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> you seem to bring so much feeling to the training and to your team, and to the fight. I kind of wonder where that feeling comes from. For the first fight I ever had, it was like, wow. It was like a release. It was like, you know what I mean? It was like, I was, I'm allowed to hit the slot, and it's making me feel better. See, I mean, I don't have a family. I grew up in care, me and my brother were put into Jones homes. We were like, he was everything, you know. He was like my mum, my dad, my brother, my sister, he was everyone. And then he killed himself. And I've never ever told anyone that. I 
I'm not, I'm not to show people a weakness. I'm broken inside, I know I am. You know, I, if it wasn't for fighting, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here. Describe your, you know, very powerful story, and you, you know that's behind you when you go into the ring. Do you think that there's a lot of people in your sport that have got similar stories? I think there's a story behind every fighter. Every fighter has an untold story. It might not just be fighters; it might be just men. Where this strange combination of hardness and vulnerability comes from and whether something as extreme as cage fighting could really be helping men deal with it was what I had to find out next. I've come to the northeast of England to confront my own issues about tough guy masculinity and to make artworks about what I find out. I felt like machismo might be holding men back. It was something the men, made for the cage, had clearly thought about. Steve, Colin, what got you into MMA or cage fighting? I was involved in things and whatever you... What do you mean by things? Well, the street, street, you, you're on the street, aren't you? You're, you're from old housing estate. You fight anyhow, so it actually gets to the point where you get involved. Yeah, you get involved with mixed martial arts, and it actually calms you down. Why is it so popular up here in the northeast, though? Because it is, isn't it? It's very popular. I think it stems from that. I think because we're born fighting, we're raised fighting. Yeah, but building up all the muscles and the tattoos and saying you go to a martial arts club, that's all part of the macho kind of armour, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't yeah. need to do that. Have you ever had a fight? Well, when I was a kid, you know, Did a you few a slaps at school, but nothing like... I never thought, oh, you know what, I must get better at this. I don't need to be tough. Nobody needs to be tough. But there must be a, it must be a reason why a lot of men up here in the North East need to be tough. Why do they need to be tough? They don't need to be, they feel the need to be. Yeah, they feel the need to be. Why up here, you know, is it particular that men feel that because need? Because then it'll get back to what we already spoke about, which is uh, monetary and, and, and the fact that it, it's harder to be in life. Now I wanted to understand the tough history and culture Stephen and Colin said lay behind all of this. Every July sees an event with deep roots in the area's industrial past. 6.30 in the morning, and after a couple of refreshing pints, the men of Trimden Grange march their banner around their former pit village. The Durham Miners Gala was about to begin. Father God, we thank you for the vision and faith of our fathers as they toiled beneath the beauty of your earth. In our fractured communities, Lord, rekindle this hope so that we who walk in the steps of our fathers may dare to seek that vision where we may rebuild our common life. What, what does that mean? That, that, you know, it's a beautiful cer ceremony. What does it mean to the people of Trimden, do you think? It means everything. It's all we've got left. It's our history. It's our future. It's our past, it's our heritage, it means everything. What does it say about the sort of men that used to work here? Hardened men, hard men, but soft-hearted. They were hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. Their men are never forgotten. And the men who went before them, and the men and boys who went after them, never forgotten. They left a good legacy on how to do things properly, how to have pride, a lot of pride. And do you think that kind of pride and respect ever has a cost? When the industry was closed down in the 80s off Thatcher, there were some big hard men who took their own lives because they couldn't cope anymore. But they weren't the type of men who would talk about the problems and the issues. They were proud that they were the, the breadwinner in the home. And when they lost that, just taken away from them. They called it a day, they couldn't cope. And it's sad. Oh, 
I spent a lot of my life being quite frightened of men, particularly the kind of strong working class men. My stepfather was a sort of hard fighting working class man and I was terrified of him most of my childhood. So I've had to overcome my own deep prejudices about the broad shouldered, pint wielding man. But coming here, I can get quite teary, really, because I can understand that the attachment to the communities that were built on the, the hairy shoulders of these blokes is a powerful thing. I'd come here to make art about men but I was finding a community who had plenty of that already, and the way they handle it reminded me of something. Every year, the people of medieval Florence used to march their most treasured artwork around the city walls. And as communities with their banners poured into the streets of Durham, I realized that something equally reverent was happening here. But if the crowds were celebratory, there was something melancholy about it too. And when I watched the blessing of the banners at Durham Cathedral, it hit me why that was. This was a stirring folk art requiem for a certain kind of man. As an artist who set himself up to make an artwork about this place, these men. I feel I've got a lot of competition from those banners. When they enter that cathedral, they are loaded up to the gunnels with feeling. You can feel it in the room. That music, the people, the way they, they, they are handled and looked at, what they mean, the kind of culture and heritage and industry that is loaded in those pieces of cloth. I feel I'm really under pressure to be able to, to deliver an artwork that can have anything as much as, as meaning as those do. I mean, I was impressed. I've never seen anything like it in Britain before, where an artwork was centre stage. And I was incredibly moved. Strong, stoical providers the bedrock of their families and communities, men who seemed as hewn from steel and brick as the world they'd built. I could see how their hard exteriors would have worked for the men then, but as the world the gala commemorates has vanished, how well was it working for their sons and grandsons now? I'm beginning to frame masculinity as a callous, if you like, on men to protect them from the, the hardships of working in very heavy industries. And so when they need to change and be flexible in the modern workplace and they need to be emotionally resilient they struggle because that carapace they've built around them, it just shatters or snaps or folds. It doesn't bounce. There can be a price to pay for fronting Macho, and I kept hearing it here. Two people had now volunteered stories of suicide, and little wonder, it's now the biggest killer of men under 45 in Britain. And the northeast of England has by far the highest rate. Nearly 80% of the people who kill themselves in this part of the world are male. What sort of man was your son, Daniel? Um, fun-loving, funny. 
life and soul of the party. Um, everyone loved him. Just loved enjoying life. Thelma's son, Daniel, had taken his own life 18 months before we met. So you had no inkling whatsoever? No, not at all. He would be the last person in the world, I would say, would take his own life. He was here looking after his brother, brothers and sister. He would never, ever have done what he did, thinking that one of them could have found him if he had been in his right mind, if he hadn't been, I don't know, in a really dark place. Um, I think he felt like he wanted to die in the moment, but I don't think he wanted to die forever. He didn't, he didn't want to die forever? No, no. And that month, in November 2013, we found out from the coroner's office that there'd been 14. 14 in a month? And I was like, oh my God, it's like, what's happening? It's a, an epidemic, you know, that's the way you feel. And when I go to the cemetery, you know, I, I'll say, e, Daniel, or a daft thing you've done. So many men felt like strangers, not just to those around them, but to themselves. On a cold, wet Saturday night in Newcastle, I went out drinking with some of Daniel's best mates. As the only man wearing any kind of jacket, I stood out a mile. What we're here to talk about is your friend, Dan. Loved like the pieces. He loved being out, loved being with the boys. Loved having a crack. You would never, you would never expect what happened with him to ever happen. So you never saw him down. Never, never ever. I could probably count on on one hand the times I've had like a good heart to heart with him. The, the majority of the time, he would, if there was, I could tell it was something the matter, but he wouldn't. But I, talk, he didn't want to talk about it. When you're out with the lads, it's like a, a defence mechanism, is yeah, it? You don't it's... put yourself down. You go out to be with the lads to laugh. If I mean, it... I think yourself, if I'm laughing, then nothing's bothering us. There's a macho stigma surrounding like being out with the lads, and that you, nobody wants to be seen as not being the man, and everybody uh, wants I... to be seen as being strong. I just got angry when I think that that he didn't say or, or just say anything of what he was feeling at the time. Because if he had have said anything of what he was feeling at the time. I would have been there in a heartbeat, you know what I mean? Before it happened, I sent him a text message asking ask where he was. In reply, just saying he was in the house. And uh, it was literally, as I'm aware, 45 minutes before um, he passed away. So I think about it like, quite a lot. I've, I've sort of got the text on my phone and I don't want to, I don't want to delete it. It's like a comfort thing, you know? I just I don't know what it is. It's like a little tombstone as well. Yeah. I've got, to put a, um, I've got a tattoo on my leg. Can I have a look? Yeah, of course you can, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, that's a good likeness. Yeah. So I've got, like, pictures feared, but memories are forever. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I do. I tell him nothing ever is as bad or can be as bad as to do this to yourself. Sometimes I think that men don't even know when they are sad. Really? 
Well, I think that it's something we learn as much as anything else is how to notice our own feelings. Mm -hmm. I don't think men are always encouraged to be sensitive to themselves, you know, and to recognize what they're feeling is sadness. They're not encouraged to notice how they're feeling, you know. I'm, making, I'm going to make an artwork about this and about the sort of nature of masculinity and this particular part of the country. And I mean, one thing that keeps coming up in a way is, this, is the way that men have a kind of, it's a kind of skin that they build up. It's their muscles, it's mm -hmm. their tattoos, it's mm -hmm. their bravado, it's their banter. Mm -hmm. It's all the things that we think of as masculine. And it doesn't just come from, you know, one generation, it goes back, right back to the time when men had to be really hard, you know, when they were working in the pits and in the shipyards. And the weight of that very armor they build up, you know, in the end is, is, is kind Too of like quite a burden, yeah. I just wonder if he, if he did know how many people loved him. I've been spending time in the northeast of England, trying to understand macho maleness, and I've seen the fragility it can sometimes mask for men. And so when it came to starting the first of my artworks on the subject, I knew exactly what kind of object could tell that story. You know, I make pots, that's my most sort of well-known output. And so it's a no-brainer for me, but I, I, it also fits in with what I'm trying to do here, which is to make a very sort of feminine artefact about a very masculine subject. So it's going to be very decorative, very nice, probably pinks and maybe turquoises, lots of pretty sparkly layered bits, sort of almost frilly. And atop it is a tragic monument to the downside of some of the traits of masculinity. It goes right back to the way that little boys and little girls are conditioned. Boys are told to suck it up. Certainly boys of my generation. I didn't see a man cry until I was 40. 40? It's working for me. I travelled back to the northeast to ask some of the fighters I'd spent time with how they navigated these troubled waters. For Colin, the freak show Fletcher, fighting was all part of a performance. And maybe macho masculinity was too. At first, it was like a scary, evil clown to kind of protect me from fighting people in front of thousands of people in a cage. As a young guy, I, I was horrifically soft. <laughs> and I used to get picked on. So I found MMA as a release for the aggression I kind of felt at the time. And over the time, it's turned into something else. Maybe the therapy worked. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, if, if you were, you know, you said that you had, yeah, you were bullied well. as a kid, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe you got to the point where you thought that kid is safe now. Yeah. But I can still remember the beginning. When you needed that armour. Yeah, when I needed it. And, that, and this does remind us of that still. It's funny I can't identify with that because, you know, when I dress up now, I still takes me back to the very first time I spontaneously did it when I was, what, 12 I was. And so it takes me back to that need, that yearning I had in those days. I didn't understand at all then. And now 
I mean, and like you as well, it's become, you know, to a certain extent, part of my work as well. You know, people expect me sometimes to dress yeah. up and it's been very useful, but it had a different beginning. Yeah, exactly. I'm still kind of probably finding myself at the age of 32, you know what I mean? And I'm respected for being a decent person. And that, for me, is massively more important than being respected for being a fighter. You know what I mean? I'd... The more you talk, Colin, the more you're know, like this sort of extreme through. version of what every man is sort of struggling with in a way. You know, you're, you're, you know if, if only men would relent <laughs> in the way that you talk like that. You know, the guy at you know, the traffic lights who's revving his car up. You know, if everyone you said, yeah, this may be not a good idea, maybe it's more important that people see me as a nice chap than I beat you away from the lights. Because his fighting is so incontrovertibly masculine, Colin clearly felt he could push self-expression as far as he liked, and he took it to some splendidly cartoonish lengths. Is that an off-the-shelf item, that? Yeah. Top shop. For man? Yeah. For man, no, top man, surely, top man, not top yeah, shop. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have a dream of suffering from a woman's clothing shop. <laughs> 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 you like that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and it wasn't just Colin who'd found some perspective on himself. To steal himself for his performances, Alex studies Homer. I rejoined him a few hours before his big fight, and as he always does on fight days, he was analysing Troy. The script fits with the, the script I go through in my own head. But I think that might be part of the reason why I, I attach myself to Achilles in it, because he's just single-minded, knows what he wants to do, he's going to do it, doesn't care if he upsets people. If I wasn't arrogant or didn't have that, that selfish gene in us, you know, like driving us to be like this, I would just be average. I'm putting everything on the line when I do this, when there's only me and one other person's centre of attention. I think that's, that's where I get the, the release from and why, that's the reason why. All of us somewhere, particularly men, hold some kind of mythic narrative deep within inside us that, that needs sort of playing out in our real lives in some way. And, and these guys, because they've got the opportunity, because they, they're training for combat, they're training for a real fight. The rest of us, we might sort of play it out in different ways in our lives. We might want to get one over someone on someone at the office, or we might sort of carve someone up in the traffic. But. Um, that idea of the man sort of standing out a, a, amongst his fellow men. A lot of people, like, they, they might say, oh, yeah, I'm a little bit rock and roll, or I'm a maverick, I'm, I'm crazy. You know, this idea that they want to stand out against the tribe. This seems to manifest itself very clearly here in the MMA world, this need to search for the heroic narrative. I think that if, if we admit to ourselves, yeah, I'd like to be a hero, I'd like to be an individual, I'd like to stand out, I think it's healthy, it's good, because we've got it in us, we, we've all got to express it somehow. Some guys have to go and fight it out in a ring, other people, maybe they have to have an exhibition in a gallery. They might be acting out a script about being a manly hero, but they're well aware of how ornamental it all is now. It's the old idea of tough, muscled men doing hard, scary work, only reinvented as a leisure spectacle for the modern age. And as one way of dealing with their troubled inheritance, I feel men like Alex and Colin might have a lesson for us all. It's interesting, you know, that the cage fighters seem to be OK, you know, they, they, they've worked it out they're, and they're working out their aggression and their feelings, you know, in what they do. 
the people who look the hardest aren't necessarily the hardest men. I think the men, that are the, the hard men, are the, the sort of brittle, non-communicative, stoic, working men, the ones that bottle up their feelings. And of course, the downside of this is that it, the pressure, the emotional pressures they're going through, if they've got any kind of unhappiness or depression, it builds up inside them and it's got nowhere to go and it's self-destructive and tragically it all too often ends in suicide. So I would never thought of it. I never thought, but I might hold up these cage fighter guys as some kind of example of <laughs> what, what, what it is to be a kind of touchy-feely man. I mean, they are touching and feeling each other quite a lot, quite often quite hard. <laughs> Heroism, theater, violence, death, if my art about the men of the Northeast was going to do them justice, I was going to have to dramatically up the ante when I showed them what I'd done. It would soon be time to show my artworks to the people who had inspired them, and they were turning out to be more personal than I could possibly have imagined. Seeing the banners being blessed, was such an evocative and powerful ritual that focused around a piece of material culture that it was a no-brainer about what I was going to make because, you know, I'm in the business of making objects and there was a celebration of an object that was central to their identity and very much central to an idea of masculinity. So I'm going to make a banner, a tapestry banner, and it's about that kind of inherited masculinity. Right in the center of it is the boy, because these men were all boys once, and that's where they learn unconsciously to become those sort of men. We all have to deal with the same set of problems in some ways. I found it very touching because, you know, it reached into me and into parts of, of my own history. And I'm, I look at that figure on the left there and I would say, is that not a working class, skilled tradesman like your father, Grayson? And is that man on the right there, the wrestler, is that not? Your stepfather? And he's not the little boy clutching his teddy bear in the middle, is that not you? But this personal work was about to become a very public statement of everything I'd learnt about men and machismo today. It wants to be central on the pole as well. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I've come back to Durham Cathedral and the men of Trimden Grange have agreed to help me march my banner out. Very pleased. It sees everything, doesn't it? It does, I it hope. It does, of course it does. Death of a working hero, that's what it's called. Fantastic.
Hello, Alex. <laughs> You're on here somewhere. Oh, yeah. There you are. Look there, look. Absolute shock. <laughs> How did you feel when you when you heard the band strike up? I, I didn't know exactly what was going on, and then when I seen this, the the when it said it's time to talk, it really appealed to us and made us think because it chasing my dream and doing what I do, I put myself under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And one of the mistakes I've made was to not talk about my fears of failing at that. That's really a century to that's one of the kind of almost, you've almost encapsulated there, kind of one of the sort of masculine dilemmas of this sort of drive thing, you know, to achieve and to be, to get your status. And it's frightening, yeah. you know, and you get it wrong and you, and you could fail when the people don't talk about that, you know, and, and, and it, what you realise is as soon as you talk about it, that it's not as, as bad as you thought. No. Oh. I like that little child at the centre leg. Well, we've all got one of those inside yeah, us, yeah. you know. Yep. Doesn't get off very often, does he? Well, that's what I think on that might be a well, shame. Well, some people can't. <laughs> I, I think we, you... I, I think, think we let them out a little bit. <laughs> I think, yeah, maybe you and I. <laughs> yeah, let them out a bit more often than others. And I think that's what I... That was interesting, actually, that you, you put it like that, because, yeah. you know, one of the things I noticed up here, particularly talking to the fighters, yeah. was how relaxed they were about you know, you particularly Most talking stuff. about what was going on yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah, You've got to, haven't you? can hold stuff back. Bulletproof, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but if the cage fighters were feeling what the works were saying, I wondered whether Daniel's friends... Hello again. ...would feel them too. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. The thing what stood out was most is it, it looks very much like a, a photo that we would have took with Dan on a night out as yeah. well. Do you know oh, what really? I mean? It, oh, really? Wow. And that was the first thing what stuck out was it was like... That like group photo. Yeah, it was like a group photo and it, it was very, like, it brung a lot together from the way we used to be. That's an interesting, that one, yeah. The person whose reaction I cared about the most was Daniel's mother, Thelma. Here we are. I just... I didn't know what to expect, but... Thoughts. It's amazing. It's all sensitive as well, Grayson. Well, I want it to look quite feminine. Yes. To sort of maybe say something about, you know, the, the relationship men have with their feelings, really. And did you have it kind of in your head of what you oh, were going to do? As soon as I saw the tree, I thought did that. You? Yeah, I thought that was a lovely image. Yeah. So, oh, well, that's great. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Dan would have loved it. He would have. Thank you. Thank you for making it. It wasn't until today when I saw the banner for the first time and I saw the pot here, you know, in front of the altar that so many things that I was thinking about really came together. The idea that this is a monument, that this is an altar to a kind of a sort of sacred idea of manhood that perhaps he's dying. And so that feeling that I had at the gala that the banners were like coffins being brought in, coffins for a way of life, that was reiterated. <laughs> On the banner it says there's a time to change. You know, maybe that's what men have got to relax into and, and, and the idea that they mustn't grip onto their old role too, until their knuckles are white. They've got to let go. And I think, you know, we've seen the emotion here today and the, the people here have been so warm and appreciative. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly touched. And I think that is all the, the memorial that I need, really, for these works. Mm -hmm.